So here we're talking about compliance and resistance, and there are many issues here about who is complying to what. And what I'm interested in is not just simply uh, the, the clients complying to us or us complying to some theory or us complying to what they expect, but um, looking at these complexities of, uh, at the various issues that are forming what we consider meaningful choices and meaningful issues in life. So, in other words, the, there is something about what I would call the societal discourses, the societal way, the way society considers these issues and this impact on us well before and deeper than what we think. It's not just simply our own pathology and what happens interpersonally, but these wider views about what relationships are, what is suffering, etc. this matter as well. So my focus today will be much more on that side, on, on the compliance in relation to these wider issues. So let's see where this will take us to. Um, it goes without saying. Not only Philip said it yesterday, but this is work in progress. These are reflections, and I would like to share them with you. I would like to hear more from you. But at the same time, let's be realistic that, you know, there's a lot of complex things that I've been thinking over the years. For the first, you know, recently I started talking to people like you. <laughs> and uh, uh, th there is a lot of more stuff behind this. So I look forward to discussing with you separately, individually, uh, when we have time today or tomorrow. So, also like a, an academic and a social scientist, I'm interested in this complexity in terms of, you know, um, who complies and who resists and to what. Um, this has been covered already by some uh, previous speakers. So, when we're talking about the who, then we have the, usually the mental health care recipients, uh, would call them, I, in different contexts they are called patients, clients, analysants, customers in, in some places, yes, uh, customers of services, beneficiaries in the humanitarian work, we talk about beneficiaries, uh, parishioners or helpies. I don't know if uh, in the 70s there used to be the discipline of helping and there were the helpers and the helpies. I don't remember, I don't know if, you, if any of you remember that. <laughs> yes, okay. And then we have the mental care providers, the therapists or whatever. And then, but then it's wider us as human beings, as citizens, um, as people belonging to society, where we're considering these issues and these issues matter to us. And we count as well. So it's not just only between those two. And of course, the question is to what be compliant or to what to be resistant? And um, to begin with, you know, we have different combinations. Um, if we're talking about the mental health, uh, uh, mental, health uh, uh, care, mental health care providers, we're talking about their own personal views because when they are talking to people, they, they talk about their own personal views, their own professional views. Um, also the theories they represent, so to speak. But also I would say something like a wider, again, I'm talking about these wider societal discourses in terms of what do we believe as society, and nobody has sat down to write this down, but there are prevailing dominant discourses, as we would say, about what is cure or what is a problem, what is treatment, etc. And okay, when we're talking about what is the spirit, you know, I'm looking at the title, um, we're talking about the spirit of these things, and of course, where does the Holy Spirit fit into this? Then I want to say something about uh, the Sorry, what was, yeah. Therefore, 
strictly speaking, if we're really trying to be systematic, we need to sort of create a kind of a grid where we can put all of this together and try to sort of see who complies and who resists to what. So here we have the uh, recipients, uh, uh, mental health recipients, healthcare recipients, and us as the family. And here are the mental health care providers' own views, professional views, professional culture, and this is the societal discourses. Um, and, and what I'm interested in is in that, but actually, as you can see, that affects, of course, the professional cultures that uh, mental health care providers provide, and of course, have a, an, a strong impact in a less way the, on the other ones as well. And what is psychological? Is psychological just only when we're thinking about thoughts and feelings? Um, fact, but what are the actual factors that affect the way we experience? events and phenomena. It's not just only our psychology or it's not just only our intrapsychic factors or our interpersonal dimensions, but also what we refer to as sociopolitical wider perspectives, but also something else that I want to introduce and I feel very strongly about, and that is the epistemological dimensions. In other words, how do we formulate our understanding of these phenomena. Epistemology is the uh, philosophical inquiry into the nature, conditions, and extent of human knowledge. Basically, it helps us understand how do we know that we know what we take for granted that we know. <laughs> Catch that. It's very difficult, but we take it for granted. We take for granted that we know certain things. Now, I know that this is a microphone. We all take it for granted it's a microphone. But do we take it for granted that this is a problem? What is a problem? Who defines it? What procedures have taken place to give meaning to certain things to be defined as a problem? And by whom? and when, and for what duration, et cetera. So if we, if we, if we have some kind of epistemo what I call epistemological acumen, then we be interested in trying to understand these complexities. So in a sense, epistemology helps us understand where our primary conceptualizations of phenomena come from. And this conceptual of the phenomena is not just only about what happens in us, so to speak, inside us, so to speak, but also about around us and, and of the world, etc. So the epistemological dimension of ment mental health care is for me of paramount importance, especially because it is neglected and it is there and it is operative. So what lies behind our explicit or mostly implicit conceptualizations of what is a psychological problem? What is trauma? What constitutes treatment, cure, healing? Just simply these three words imply completely different, different cultures, different ways of understanding things. And usually we sort of ad lib, we select one or the other. Um, but what makes us think of this or that or the other? And then what is stress? What is distress? What is suffering? Why suffering? These are operative in everything that we do, but we don't think about that. We take them for granted. And then we are focusing on our theories that we're interested in and we get excited about that. But what precedes that is our epistemological formulation of those situations in the first place. And in a sense, you know, what is the actual nature of human beings? It just really is so fundamental. So if I were to define what I'm really focusing on, I would say that the, sum to the, that the societal discourse on mental health care is in effect 
the sum total of implicit epistemological presuppositions that lie behind the explicit theories and precepts of the various professional and psychotherapy schools about all the related phenomena to healthcare. They have profound implications on how we conceptualize not only our problems and the expected and aspired solutions, but also our very lives. And they are of vital importance because, as I keep repeating, its impact is defining and yet is not noticeable. Therefore, our task, as I said, is to develop an epistemological acumen or a, an epistemological agility to discern the societal discourses, the dominant narratives which form the presuppositions of the mental health theories that are propagated and which we follow or criticize. And this is really the epistemological cycle um, which we take for granted because basically um, we start from our epistemological position. What do we see in the first place? How do we understand that? That will position us, position is a verb, position us in a certain position <laughs> that will have implications of where we can locate this understanding. And that will help us, well, that will dictate, really, the range of possible actions that we see. And what usually happens is, uh, is that if the action does not work, we try a different action and a different action and a different action. We're, we try another, another technique, another theory, another school. But perhaps what this diagram suggests is that basically we need to go back and see have we conceptualized the, the question correctly in the first place? Because if we haven't, then we'll just ca carry on replacing one theory with another, and then we will still be in the same place. So I want to start specifically with um, what St. Siluan tells us once. I'll mention one incident that is in, in his, uh, in his uh, writings. That's an incident when he's saying that he was eating fish and he, had a, a, he got an, a fish bone in his throat. And that was really very, very sore. And also at the same time, he had headaches. Saint Siluan makes a distinction. So he said he prayed for both of these discomforts to go away. And if we read carefully what he says, he says this. Um, it, it's a long story, and I, I really urge you to, to read it. It's a very, very beautiful story, the, how he prayed and he, uh, he realized that what he had to do was cough, uh, out and he did cough, and then some blood came, and the and the fish bone came out, and uh, and and he and he was cured from that. But the headaches didn't go. So Saint Siluan says, "What?" Says, "Aha, aha! God cured my sore throat, but he didn't cure my headaches. Therefore." Therefore, there is some meaning in my headaches. And he felt, God feels, his will is that I should have that headache. So he makes a distinction between certain suffering, so to speak, that we can get rid of and have a better life, and another suffering that has other meaning. Now, <laughs> what we usually do, we try to say, well, what was the meaning that, you know, why did God want him to have a, you know, you don't ask that question. You can ask me, you can ask, I can ask you about that, but how do you ask God about that? 
You open your, your heart up to that. You don't just simply say, tell me why I have a headache. And you formulate a logical question and answer. That's the difference. So he's making an epistemological difference between two types of suffering. Do we? Do our therapies? Do? Does our, do our societal discourses on mental health do? Any discomfort we see as something that we should get rid of. So here is the fishbone and the headache, and for me are very defining to tell us right from the beginning. So now you see how I connect the epistemology with orthodoxy in this context. It's providing us a different epistemology. How do we conceptualize that suffering? There is another, there are different ways of conceptualizing suffering. So, if we want to tease it out a little bit, I mean, uh, I think you got it, but uh, in, a, in effect, I can say since Cyril's epistemology is that all adverse events create discomfort, which is obvious, you know, we're human beings, but not all discomfort needs to be avoided or eliminated. And within a wider context and perspective, not in terms of my own comfort and avoidance of suffering, a degree of discomfort or adversity can be helpful and instructive. It may aid us to transform and widen our epistemology to locate us in the wider context of God's creation. And this is, in effect, what metania means. Metania is changing of news, which is not just simply the intellectual part of our being, but is the way we conceptualize affliction, our whole epistemology. And this is what creates the conditions to be open and receptive to different ways of conceptualizing our affliction. So this is St. Silwan's epistemology with this distinction. So <laughs> if we're really orthodox and we follow this or that psychological theory, whatever, I would ask, does it make that distinction? If it doesn't, be careful. So I would say that dealing with adversity from an orthodox perspective, um, and this is not mine, I mean, this is my understanding of what the church fathers tell us, is that essentially, if I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm sort of <laughs> summarizing basic points of, the, of, of a highly complex situation, and, and, uh, and uh, understanding of these issues. But I would say that basically orthodoxy tells us very clearly that God is good. There is no, that's not negotiable. God is good. And God allows only a type of adversity in terms of quantity, quality, or timing that he knows that will not destroy us, but not unconditionally, provided that we open our hearts and follow his will and not our own will, that is expand our own perspective and time frame, then adversity not only will harm us, not harm us, but actually it will enrich us. I would say that this is the summary of what um, the church fathers tell us. And the challenge of course is that, you know, what is our will? A will is actually the way, we def the way we define the problem to begin with. And that we don't even question usually. We, we, we could question 20,000 things after that. But the very definition of why we consider that as a problem, Alexandra was saying, that is a problem. That is a problem that we're incompatible. And I was basically saying to her, is it? I don't know. She took it for granted. And she was looking for solutions. You know, remember the three, the three spheres. With that epistemology, he was looking solutions for everywhere. To be told, you know, how to deal with the incompatibility. Perhaps she has to live through the incompatibility and that will tell her something. So, 
a will is defined, so I'm trying to translate this in reality. A will is defined in terms of the way we define the problem and the range of solutions. The way we assume what well-being is, which often is defined mainly in terms of material and social gain, happiness, avoidance of suffering, etc., and in terms of time frame. I mean, how many times in our own lives we, we, we go through some real adversity and after that we say later, well, actually, that was good that that happened to me. So we have no patience. Not only we define things in our own way, but we want to see it now like the, all the instant coffee and instant gratification and instant everything. We want it now. So we cannot wait and sort of see what happens, where this will lead us to. Alexandra wanted a solution now. And that was your problem. Or the idea of seeing things through or creating conditions to see things differently was not there. So this is a tangible way for me how to understand what our will is. Our will is manifested in the way we define things. Now, that, that's, that's scary. Can we talk about, about God's will? Of course we don't know God's will. But we can, I can surmise certain things. And that will be the unexpanded perspective, trusting what we said earlier, that we are God's creatures and that he has a plan for our salvation. Now, this is actually serious. If we are orthodox and we believe that, that's actually very serious, that he has a plan for our salvation. We do not believe in a God that created the universe and just left it there and, and we, we are full of suffering and all of that. He cares for you and me every day. How do we put that, our therapies, in that context? So, we don't know God's will, but if we can orient ourselves, if we can expand our epistemology to somehow include that perspective, then not, not we will know God's will, but we will be able to ex get outside the narrow confines of our own will. And, of course, well-being defined beyond our own concept of happiness. And the frame is quite expanded. Expanded? I mean, I mean every day we say, and to the ages of ages. <laughs> what does that mean? When we live and we want, you know, I'm, uh, my, my throat is sore from this. I want it to be cleared now. What is the meaning of, 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 of a different and expanded, expanded time frame? Not only for later in our lives, but even possibly even later. So when I'm thinking of that, I'm just thinking of uh, some of the work that I do. Yeah, you heard I do work in different parts of the world with reference to um, yeah, different traumatized people from political violence and disasters, etc. This is some work that I've been doing in, uh, in, uh, in Sierra Leone because I think some of you may know Father Themis, Father Themistocles. Um, and and, and that's, that's an interesting, you know, um, context where you go there even for a couple of weeks and um, you come across death almost every day. People come that you have met within a couple of weeks and they say, uh, my brother died. How did he die? Oh, he got ill. But what, what did he die of? Oh, he got ill. If you get ill, you die. That's a different perspective. Life is so unpredictable. We're so sheltered by, by our own security and safety and everything, and we have insurance for everything in case something goes wrong, etc. You know, it, it's different to live in a place where you don't know what's going to happen in the evening. So that kind of unpredictability, that insecurity, opens you up in a different way. And 
I learned a great deal from all these wonderful people that I meet in different parts of the world. So, I am not going to tell you many things here. I'm going to remind you of some of the um, treasures of orthodoxy. Um, which are incredibly revolutionary. What St. John Chrysostom says, that no one can harm the man who does not injure himself, it's staggering. Basically, whatever happens to you, it's up to you whether you're going, how you're going to see it. Nothing to do with the external misfortune. If you're going to receive it in a certain way, you're going to damage yourself. Nothing to do with the way that society defines it, or our own wish for clarity and for permanence and for, and for, and for comfort, etc. That's an incredibly revolutionary, incredibly revolutionary statement. And of course, it's not just a statement, it's a whole, it's a whole teaching, it's a whole, it's a whole culture. It's a whole culture. And this is what I'm thinking. Yes, I've been training clinical psychologists, family therapists, um, uh, Jungian psychoanalysts, etc. Uh, what is close to this? There isn't anything close to that. Everything is defined by our own societal criteria. St. Dorotheos of Gaza, we had a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> presentation earlier, and I wish we, we were here more, but anyway, um, uh, I go to Lebanon, so I'll get in touch with, <laughs> yeah, we'll discuss things more. He says that the grace of God comes swiftly to the soul when endurance is no longer possible. When endurance is no longer possible. Alexandra did not have any endurance. Endurance is not is not a virtue that we even use today or understand or value. Endurance. We see it as passive, we see it as um, wimp, uh, we see, you know, we want to be active and do our own will, etc., etc. This is a culture that we live in. But the idea of endurance, and when you, s you come to the end of your endurance, St. Dorotheo says, then God's grace will come to you. We don't even get close to that. Then, um, I, I don't want to go too much on this, uh, but St. Nicola uh, Cavasilas is talking about the, um, the trauma, and um, okay, very quickly to sort of run through this, in choosing to live autonomous from God, man distances himself from God and sins. In other words, the distance is the sin. Whatever you do after that is sin. Sin has two elements, the act itself and the trauma. Trauma means the mark. I mean, I teach a lot about trauma, you know. Um, tr trauma is the mark from being pierced, from being harmed. In this way, the habit of sin is created, the act creates the trauma passion which becomes a man's, uh, a, a, in a man, a second nature. Sin like a second nature covers man with its darkness, drowns him in the depths of forgetfulness and makes him disappear. Beautiful words, but <laughs> conveying something completely different from the usual language and conceptualizations, not just language, conceptualizations of what current mental health uh, care uh, uh, tends to. So, what is the stress and what is disorder? When, when is the headache of Sensiluan a disorder a pathology and when is it just simply a distress that our life is full of distresses? So when we're talking about distress, we're not talking just about um, psychological, psychiatric, or mental health and, and, and pathology, and that's a very huge chapter. It's a very, it's a very important thing that we need to consider as mental health professionals. Society 
seems to have chosen psychology to interpret everything that is complex and is difficult for them to understand. But is that psychology? Is that psychology? When people experience this kind of distress, it, things are much more wider. These are existential or ontological. When people are traumatized in whatever situations that we're talking about, they are, they are shaken to the, whole of the, to the core of their beings. It's not just simply uh, some discomfort. So spiritual, epistemological, ontological, these are important considerations. And usually we sort of say psychological. You know, there is a shooting somewhere. We send some psychologists, some counselors to deal with it. Why don't you send imams? Or why don't you send priests? Why don't you send bankers? I don't know. I mean, why do we send these psychologists? And of course, as psychologists, I'm, I'm, I'm a psychologist, we, 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 we feel great, you know, because you know, we're, we're, we're saving the world. We're the new saviors. We love that. If we go back to even Aristotle, he was, talk, he was making a, 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 even then, he was making a distinction between two types of well-beings. One is, he called it hedonic, which is basically avoidance of suffering, and the other he called it eudaimonic, and demonic is to do fulfilling our destinies, connecting with our good demons, but demons not in terms of Satan or devil, but sort of the, uh, our... Uh, uh, creative uh, nature inside us, according to an ancient Greek uh, word. Um, and if we look at St. Paul, um, you just sort of, you know, if we look at a couple of things of St. Paul talking, again, against the uh, pre predominant epistemology of mental health today, when he's talking about my power made perfect in weakness, we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and all of that, completely different from our mental health perspectives today. Completely different. So we go on Sunday, we read St. Paul, and then the rest of the time we just practice mental health, where it's completely different from this. Out of weakness we are made strong, asthenia, is weakness, is illness, is lack of sthenos, lack of, is listlessness, is sort of giving away. You don't, you don't feel life in you. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. This is a very important, uh, I don't want to go into this uh, Colossians 1.24, but um, again is rejoicing in my sufferings. This is a completely different epistemology. Can we open up our hearts to try to understand what that means and how it relates to our everyday life in terms of mental health professionals? So in, if we're talking about a, an orthodox perspective, we're talking about nuthesia. And again, you remember metania is nous again, and nuthesia is nous again. And nuthesia is the thesis, is the, is the position of the nous is placing the nous in its appropriate place, educating, nurturing, or forming, etc. Okay, but there is more use of the, and, and <laughs> look at the, you know, the usual translation of the King, uh, King James Version of this, you know this, uh, is from Ephesians 6.4. Um, provoke not our children to wrath, and bring them up in the nurture, and admonition of the Lord? No, there's nothing about admonition. Nuthesia kiriu, is the training and instruction closer to that. That's the uh, New International Version. Um, so we need to be a little bit careful about uh, translation of, uh, of key uh, scriptures in terms of how much they follow the predominant discourses of our mental health discourse now. So metania, as we said before, is, 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 is the change of, of perception. Another, another thing that is, of course, very important is the understanding of pathos. Which pathos, of course, simply means neutrally that which has happened and that which has befallen us. And of course, you know, we the apathy, sympathy, and empathy, and psychopathology. But we use the same word. I don't know if you have, I'm sure you must have thought about that. 
We talk about the holy passion, the Agia Pathi, and of course we talk the, the enslaving passions, exactly the same word, exactly the same word, exactly the same process. The same suffering, you know, the, 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 the same, which means it's the way you construe it that matters. It's not it on its own that matters. And how do you construe it? Going back to your epistemology. What is it, what informs your epistemology to see it in this way or in that way? And of course, yeah, empathy in Christian spirituality means involved in your bad passions. But of course, in psychology, is uh, oh, you're, you're compassionate. Um, they're, they're, they're very interesting things that show us the clashes, fundamental clashes of different paradigms. Now, I want to pause a little bit on this. Um, over the years, in terms of the different work that I do in different countries, etc., I've developed this grid that helps me and helps others to understand the complexities of the wide ranges of responses when people are exposed to adversity. Let me take you through this very briefly. And then we'll see how we fit together. So when a person is exposed to adversity, and there's so much to say about that. I mean, f even the confusion between the event and the experience, we say when they're experienced to trauma. No, 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 no. They're not experienced to trauma, ex ex exposed to trauma. Nobody's exp ex exposed to a trauma. People are exposed to events. And it's trauma is the impact it has on them, is the way they experience it. But we confuse even that. So much so that we talk about traumatic event. There's no time to discuss this, but... Uh, so, we're talking about adversity. The, yeah, there are negative effects, and if we're looking at the individual family, community, and society, there are negative effects in the way they respond to adversity. The most serious one is a psychiatric disorder, and yes, like PTSD, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder. Not everybody develops PTSD, but a lot of people develop various distressful psychological reactions, various symptoms that do not add up to a psychiatric uh, category. Or the overwhelming majority of people experience ordinary human suffering. Wherever I go, the overwhelming majority of people will say to me, it was Allah's will, or I've done something wrong and Allah is punishing me. They're not saying I'm suffering from PTSD, or there are, you know, they, 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 they have a, a meaning system that they understand their predicament. So that's the negative. A lot of things, however badly a person has been affected, and our societal discourse just basically zooms there. Everything is PTSD for us. Everything is trauma. Everything is trauma. Everything is traumatized. However badly a person is affected, even if they suffer from PTSD, there are a lot of positive and negative unchanged responses in them. There are a lot of qualities, a lot of relationships, a lot of functions that have not been affected. And the positive ones is what we would call resilience. That is the resilient, resilient functions. We don't not say that a person is resilient or traumatized. It's crude. We're talking about resilient functions and traumatized functions. And of course, uh, there are negative ones as well. I mean, a person may be suspicious of people, and he was before, and he's still after, and uh, it hasn't changed at all. Um, but <sighs> what I'm very interested in is this here, that in every, in every, and, and I, I really mean it, in every situation, a person also, in addition to, not either or, in addition to whatever, negative response they have had, they have experienced to their exposure to adversity, they also develop some positive responses to adversity. In other words, the fact that they have come so close to death, the fact that they have lost everything, the fact reorients them in a different way. That's the endurance of St. Dorotheos. Once they re reach rock bottom, 
they begin to see things differently. And they will say that to us if we create this space for it, but often we don't. Because as mental health professionals, we're interested and excited only about this because we're there to fix them and we're going to help them with their, with their trauma. And we're not interested in what they learn from that. And we're not interested in, in the radical transformation that has taken place in them as a result of that exposure to adversity. All their plans, you know, wh wh when Alexandra was saying to me, my life is ruined. Yes, what does that mean now? What opportunities that op opens up? In what way can you review your life in a different way now? Because that has happened. That's a unique opportunity. And usually, as mental health professionals, we miss it. Because we're, we're excited and we're there to fix their trauma. So this is what I mean resi by resilience. I mean the existing positive co characteristics that, they, uh, that were retained from before the adversity. And ad what I call adversity activated development. Development that has been activated specifically from adversity. And some of you may know post-traumatic growth is not that. I, we don't have time to, to d discuss the difference. Uh, Post-traumatic growth means that actually trauma has taken place and the trauma has stopped, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what I'm talking about is adversity-activated development, development that has been activated explicitly from their exposure to adversity. Um, so the synergic approach, in a sense, that I I feel it's important for us to understand is synergy between, first of all, their strengths and our strengths, but also with the source of strength. And this is the challenge for us, to introduce that in our work every day. And in the context of our weaknesses, their weaknesses, and one that justifies those with, with weaknesses. So a key to an orthodox way is what is said in the tonsuring, um, which in English is unfortunately is translated, God being my helper. No, this is synergia. You being synergic with me, God. Yeah. And therefore, we, I make a distinction between, crudely speaking, between what I would call technological interventions with synergic interventions. The technological one is that I know I'm the expert because I have five degrees on the wall or two or three or 20, and I went through trainings, um, and you don't know. That's a technology. It's the same thing as I fix this. We give this to, if your, if your car is not working, you'll give it to an expert. We are governed by the societal discourse of the expert, where we buy our responsibility, we give them money to take responsibility and fix something. It's, a, it's another important societal discourse, the societal discourse of the expert. It's at the core of the mental health professions. Whereas in, within a synergic interventions, in a sense, both of us know something and we don't know something. And we're there to embark both of us to find out. And this is I'm fixing an object that offers no response, no feedback. And here I'm collaborating with a person that can relate to and interact with you. Here I'm using general laws and principles that I learned in my trainings. And here I'm focusing on the uniqueness of this person. I'm fixing a deficit in for the pathology. I'm attending to the negative facets. Of course, I'm attending to the negative facets. That's what I'm there for. But within the context of the totality of that person, that naturally includes positive facets. My expertise is in fixing you. My expertise is in collaborating with you, identifying your weakness and strengths, and working synergically. I'm focusing on fixing just you. I'm also attending to the wider contexts. And this is what, in Matthew 25, 23, I was a stranger and you took me in. No, sir. Nobody took anybody in. In Greek, doesn't say that. Doesn't say that at all. We didn't take them in for anything. No. 
It seems sinago means uh, sinago means usher, guide, carry, move, to walk along together, to accompany, to bring together, etc. Synagogue comes from that, of course, and it's accompanying, walking, walking along together. This is what Christ is saying. Synagogue ateme means you know you walk along with me, you accompany me. And also means gathering, and also means containing. It's a beautiful word, beautiful word, sinago. It's not taking me in, I'm not, we're not taking them in to, to anything. So, <laughs> where is the compliance and resistance here? Um, I don't have time, I don't have time. Um, I'm going to, I need to stop here with one example. Um, so when St. Siluan, and I, I have the great blessing of being, going to the monastery at, the, you know, at, at Essex for the last 40 years with Father Sofroni, and you know, with, we grew up with uh, St. Siluan. When he's talking about keep thy mind in help and despair not, oh, that's not a joke. First of all, hell is hell. Hell stinks. Hell is, hell is painful. It's not just simply a word. And it's saying despair not because there is another epistemology. There is, there is put things in wider context and it's not just simply in terms of a hedonistic idea of removing suffering or giving it meaning according to some interesting theory. But it is in terms of putting it in, in some context, in terms of the creation, that we're part of a creation. And God has a plan for you and me. So I want to finish with this, but I, I immediately I don't want you to look too much on, on her, and I'm going to move this back to this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to finish with this example of some person that I was working with in, um, that's in Yemen, um, in, uh, just outside Aden, uh, there is a slum area, uh, a suburb called Basadin, and uh, that's a few years ago. Now with the war, of course, it's impossible to get there. I mean, the suffering there is just unbelievable in Yemen now. Um, so the, she's a Somali woman. Um, she crossed from Somalia to, to come to Yemen. And uh, uh, oh, it's a long story. I mean, you know, if you know what happens when they cross uh, uh, the Gulf of Aden there, um, they are brutalized, they are raped, they are killed, they are thrown over by the traffickers, etc., etc. Those who survive come to Yemen, and the good thing is that immediately they are given asylum. The bad thing is that actually Yemen is one of the poorest countries on earth, and you have never seen such po poverty in your lives. And this woman has nothing, and she's sitting on the streets and begging, and she's raped con continuously. And she has two children from being raped, and she's pregnant now with the third one. And uh, she's uh, threatening and goes to the UN, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and other NGOs, and she's threatening to burn herself and her ch kill her children because life is unbearable. So um, um, once when I go and offer trainings uh, in places, I go back and I supervise and I consult, etc. And also I ask them to select their worst case that they find difficult to work with, and I work with that. So they brought me here, and um, uh, it's a long story, but again, we don't have time. I'll, I'll tell you very briefly what happened. Basically, I sat there and she started telling me, you know, she started screaming at me. She, I thought she was going to tear me apart. Um, you know, who the hell do you think you are? And you're just coming from Britain. Now you think you're going to help and nobody can help me. And uh, I can't bear it anymore. And who's going to look after me? I have nothing, etc., etc. And I was just feeling there, sitting there and taking it all in. And it was just impossible. It was just impossible. And, uh, um, and then I was sort of feeling, you know, she's right. I mean, what can I help with this, this woman? I mean, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. Um, so I started feeling absolutely desperate. Um, we had a, a camera 
crew to sort of record this for training purposes, so I was just feeling absolutely awful. And when I was beyond my endurance, I thought, aha, well now I, I have a, a, a close glimpse of what this poor woman is feeling. Okay, because talk about transference now. Yeah. Put the word, now you know what's happening. So, um, and then I said to her, um, I said, you know, in a, in a very natural way, well, what I see in front of me, what, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, um, um, so impressed and full of praise. If, if I were to experience half of what you have experienced, I wouldn't have survived. So, you know, I, I, I'm impressed by your strength. That's, that's true. That's a reality. When you see a person like that who perseveres after so many knocks all the time, and she's still there. I mean, it, it's amazing. So, do I, yes, you can see a traumatized person, but can you also have the epistemological agility to also see something else there? Remember the greed, in addition to her trauma and whatever else, also she has some strengths. This woman had remarkable strengths. And then once I started thinking about this, that she, about her strengths, I started actually going back sort of scanning, my, my, my mind computer were going click, 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 to sort of say, oh yes, ah, oh, wow. She was talking about her children's future. This woman who has absolutely nothing, she cares about her children, she cares about education, completely uneducated herself, so she has a vision for the future. That's another import, important thing that you don't, you know, if you are focusing on the, on the square of the, of, the, of the trauma, you don't see anything else. You stay there and you try to fix her. Instead, I, I try to sort of see her totality. So I saw all these strengths and then, <laughs> at the Tavistock Clinic, I spent you know, 25 years, I was in the child and family department. I know how to you know, what, you know, work with families and children. This woman was a remarkable mother. Although it was, it was an, you know, a complete chaos there with all the cameras and all of that, her two kids were walk, walking around and, and she had a remarkable way of containing them and giving them freedom. So they would sort of run a little bit around, not crazily, and then she would call them and they would come. So I said, wow. This woman has remarkable parenting abilities. She has remarkable uh, uh, mothering abilities. So I was there to fix her. So what did I say to her? I said to her how impressed I was by her strengths. And she was completely surprised. Nobody ever saw that or even herself because within the mental health system, we're focusing on her, on her damagedness. And then, and then I said to her, I am so impressed, I would very much like, because I, I knew we had uh, in the refugee camp, we had expectant mothers and new mothers. I said, I would be very grateful. In all honesty, I wasn't bluffing, I wasn't playing a game. I would be very grateful if you could kindly accept my invitation that you would help us in, in, in educating young mothers, because you are an incredibly good mother and you have skills, and I would like you to help us with that. Talking empowerment. Usually we use the word empowerment easily. You know, we empower people by saying some fancy words to them. This is empowerment. Discerning her strengths and creating conditions for her strengths to be activated. So you can imagine what happened. So this was my intervention. I'm an expert in trauma counseling. This is what I did there. I'm director of the Center for Trauma, Asylum and Refugees. I, tra I train people in working with, with trauma. This is what I did there. Translating into orthodoxy, I did not forget that that human being in front of me, it's God's creature. And I could not forget that she had some strengths, she had some beauty, 
that nobody saw. And I saw it as my task to see if I could develop an epistemological agility to hear her pain as well as also look at something else in her. And that's all I did. And that woman's life changed, as you can imagine, completely. The ways that she was seen by everybody, she started getting some money, etc., etc., her life changed completely. Now, this is not magic. This is not magic. Anybody can do that. It's just a question of having an epistemological framework that allows you to see beyond the traditional mental health perspective that society and our theories give us. I can say many more things. I am aware that Philip is waiting like a hawk there, and I don't want to <laughs> exceed. Yeah, uh, but I'll be here today and tomorrow, and if you want to continue this, uh, let me know. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah,